Welcome to worship today, everyone. This is Good Friday. It's an ironic day because we call it a Good Friday. But it's on this Friday that we remember that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified. As the Bible says, for the sins of the world, the cosmos. Let us worship him today.
Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors.
Creed for the Broken I believe in Jesus crucified, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. I believe in the infirmity of Christ. Surely he has carried our infirmities. I believe in Jesus who was despised and rejected by humankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. I believe in the Lord Jesus who was pierced for our transgressions, who was crushed for our evils. I trust in the God who heals our wounds, the one who carried our pains and our disfigurements. I believe in the crucified God, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of people, he was sacrificed. I hold to the Jesus who poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the sinners. I believe in a broken Jesus, the one who carried the sin of all people and made intercession for the lawbreakers. I trust my broken self to the Son of God.
When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Karl Barth, the theologian, once said, There is no Good Friday without Easter, and no Easter without Good Friday. In Orthodox cultures, a cross has always been seen as something intimate, something you hide from view. Only priests were allowed to wear it on the outside of their clothing. Now, in our history, crosses have always been designed to look elegant beautiful, occasionally even downright luxurious, and with even the most ancient crosses rendered unique through their style and decor. They have different centerpieces. You have the square, you have the rhombus, you have the circular. And the cross tips and branches vary from three blade points and lily-like patterns to lace motifs feel like I'm in a documentary for the cross. But it's possibly the most iconic and prolific image in the world, and of course, even in fashion. It's employed constantly by designers on t-shirts, jewelry, accessories, and even shoes. 
It's a logo that is even more famous than that of Apple, Adidas or Nike, supported by young and old. Yet ultimately referring to an instrument of death and torture and an ancient religion, not only ancient, also modern, with which most wearers feel no direct connection. So the popularity of the cross, the Christian cross, in fashion is both perplexing and remarkable. And this phenomenon is seen in high fashion. The very top designers in the past, like Versace, Ford, Gautier, and there's a globally recognized fashion accessory that is a symbol of faith apparently in decline in the West and it's selling on clothes on a scale that is suggesting that consumers are far from offended or switched off by it. And that trend is certainly still in vogue. Shirts with enormous crosses covering front or back like a giant Celtic tattoo or diamante encrusted uh, accessories that give the humble rugged cross a slightly unsettling makeover. In a forward to a book, the, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, asked, are we living with a symbol emptied of power by time and fashion? Today it is more commonly seen as a symbol of beauty to hang around your neck. And he compared such jewelry to hanging a golden gallows or a tiny electric chair around your neck. Why do Christians cling to the old rugged cross? Why do we face ridicule in the world without changing ground? Why proclaim the scandalous and glory in the shameful? P.T. Forsyth said, Christ is to us what his cross is. All that Christ is in heaven or earth is put into what he did there. Christ is to us just what his cross is. You do not understand Christ until you understand the cross. F. D. Brunner wrote, He who understands the cross aright understands the Bible and he understands Jesus Christ. The only authentic Jesus is the Jesus who died on the cross. And it is the truth of Christianity that the center of Easter is the cross of Jesus. Jesus having been scourged and beaten with a crown of thorns pushed into his head, walks along the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. He's weak and at the point of death he falls, too weak to carry his own cross. The soldiers force a man in the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross for Jesus. They continue to Golgotha, a hill on the outskirts of Jerusalem, where Jesus is crucified alongside two criminals. The evangelists in the Gospels do not dwell too much on the stripping of Christ or the clumsy hammering in of the nails, nor of the wrenching of the limbs as the cross is pulled into place. They only say that Jesus was crucified. They know too well that all people of the day knew the horror of the crucifixion. And Jesus in excruciating pain is left to die. His disciples helpless to defend him. In fact, almost none of them are there except the woman at the foot of the cross. So Jesus dies one of the most one of the cruelest and the most painful of any death devised by human beings. Many people gathered around the cross on that day. Some were concerned, some curious, some were even amused. They stood around watching the death of Jesus. Let's look at who those people were under the cross. Firstly, we see those who were at a distance from Christ. Mark 15, 40 reads, there were also women looking on from a distance 
Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joses and Salome. These used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. So at a distance stood a group of women. These women were probably at a distance because they were afraid of recognition, recognition from the crowds. And we can assume they were scared, grief stricken. They didn't want to intrude on the family who were right close at the bottom of the cross. Together with those who were at a distance, there were those who were totally disinterested, namely the Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus. Their job was to take criminals outside of the city, near the dumping ground, and to crucify them. They took no interest in Jesus except as an object of derision and the owner of a garment that they wanted. To them, Christ was of no personal interest. Mark 15, 24 says, And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. The soldiers also mocked Jesus, offering him wine and vinegar to dull his pain. But Jesus ref uh, refused it. They disinterestedly, disinterestedly put up the sign that Pilate had ordered to irritate the Jewish leaders. This is the king of the Jews. In Latin, Aramaic and Greek for all to read. They did all of this in obedience to their orders, to a kingdom that was powerful, violent and oppressed people. This was something they were good at because they were good at taking orders. Thirdly, there were those at the cross who were disgusted in Jesus and the sight of his death. They were the chief priests, the elders, the members of the Sanhedrin. Disgusted, they looked upon Jesus and his claimed claims. They were envious of his popularity and power. These were proud people, people unashamedly proud of their race, their nation, their religion, and above all arrogant about their moral life. They contested many things with Jesus, and often Jesus got the better of them, often putting them into corners, the very corners that they tried to edge Jesus into. Now their struggle with Jesus was essentially one of power. Jesus challenged their authority demonstrating an authority even as a baby boy which the leaders of Israel lacked and the sight of the cross was a victory to them they had cajoled the crowds to accept Barabbas instead of Jesus but it was a bitter victory an eyesore a curse because it is written in the law cursed is he who hangs on a tree their disgust is evident as they slander Jesus. Mark 15, 31. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot even save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. They are unbelievers. And they demonstrate their unbelief as they argue against the raising of the sign above the Christ. But the Roman soldiers deny their request as the king of the Jews dies. Not only were there those who were disgusted, but there were also those who were disbelieving. The disbelieving people and the disbelieving thief. They mock Jesus together with their leaders and the Romans. The very people who had welcomed him into Jerusalem praised him as he came in, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now curse him, heaping insult upon insult upon him. The one thief on the cross alongside of Jesus hurls mocking insults, saying in Luke twenty-three thirty-nine. 
aren't you the Christ? Save up yourself and save us. The disbelievers before the cross of Christ. Directly below the cross were two people Jesus dearly loved. His mother Mary and John his disciple. Both were there to see Jesus die a slow and awful death. Let's call them the disillusioned. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the woman who had born Jesus, whom the angel of the Lord had called blessed, the one who fed Jesus, clothed him, laughed and cried with him, now seeing her son dying. I'm sure she was disillusioned agonizing over the reason for his death and what God's purpose was in this ugliness. Then there is John, the beloved, the one whom the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus loved. He walked with Jesus day and night for three years. He'd been ministered to by Jesus. He'd seen Jesus perform signs and miracles. He had heard Jesus declared by Peter to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. John, who had his feet washed by Jesus, who lay his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper, now sees his best friend, his Lord, his Master, die. Mary and John, the disillusioned. Sixthly, there were two men who saw Christ as true and divine. There is the discerning thief and the discerning centurion. Where one thief mocks and ridicules Christ, wanting to be free from his punishment, the other thief recognizes his sinfulness, his own sinfulness, and rebukes him, saying, Luke 23, 40, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, we have been condemned, condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he asked Jesus in iconic words, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The centurion, also one of the Roman soldiers there, during the entire, is there during the entire crucifixion. And he recognizes something different in Jesus. Maybe it's something about the way he died. Maybe it's something about his purity. But he sees Jesus as someone truly righteous, despite the death he died and the way he died. Matthew 27, 54, it says, Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. The discerning centurion. Now let us look, turn from looking at the people around the cross to the man on the cross. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, an insignificant little town, the son of Mary, a virgin, a man who lived his life in Nazareth as a carpenter, and the last three years of his life traveled with 12 men, his disciples, a man who healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead, welcomed the insignificant, those on the fringes of society. He spoke as no man ever did. Many men and women followed him. He was a man of love, seen with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with the destitute, the so-called unlovely, the down and outs. Jesus is nailed to the cross for crimes he did not commit. Even Pilate, the Roman procurator, could not find fault in him. This, this echoes the words from Isaiah 53 I read earlier. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. 
Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Without struggle and without even one word in his defense, he died for the sins of the world. The world. Christ did not die, as many people think, as a great martyr, as in, just as an example of how people are to love. He died to be a sacrifice to God for us. The cross, as far as God is concerned, shows us the seriousness with which God views people, the, the posture of God towards all people. When Jesus shouted out the words on the cross, the words tetelestai, it is finished. He was not, as Albert Schweitzer had said, uh, speaking about his failed life and mission, because Schweitzer said that Jesus put his shoulder to the wheel of the cart of the kingdom to move it, and it was, he was crushed under its wheel, a task too heavy to handle. And then by default, he brought in the kingdom. No, that is not what happened. It is finished is a cry not of defeat, but of victory. It means it is completed. It is finished. The victory has been won for all who believe. Jesus dies on the cross to save the world, to love the world. God loves us from the cross. Look at those words of love from Jesus as he dies, just before he dies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. To those who crucified him, mocked him, spat upon him, insulted him, his only words were words of love. Father, forgive them. To the criminal alongside of him, he called, who called out to Jesus to remember him. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. To the mother who bore him, Jesus seeks the best. He calls his mother to stay with and be John's mother. And for John to look after her. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In 1 John 4 verse 8, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus on the cross is the ultimate demonstration of the love of God. Now let us return to the people at the cross, because I'd like to call your attention to somebody else at the foot of the cross, a person I have not yet mentioned someone not often spoken about. Who is this person? And where does this person stand in relation to Christ? Well, that person is you. You and I, we are before the cross, facing Jesus on this Good Friday. We face the love of God. God demonstrating this love by the death of himself. And I would like to ask us, where do we stand in relation to the cross? Are we distant, not realizing or wanting to realize the true significance of this death? Maybe we're distant because we're scared of involvement. May I say that Jesus never feigned involvement. He never distanced himself from you and he does not distance himself from you today. The cross is as real today as ever. 
His death was for you. His cry of forgive them is for you. Maybe you are disinterested. The church or Jesus has never meant much to you. You realize it happened, but you have no interest in how it, what and how it can affect you. Maybe today you will have to decide. You don't have to, but you can decide how you will look at Jesus. Maybe you will say, I've heard what you said about his death, but I remain disinterested. Jesus is interested in you and your life. He wants to know you intimately. He wants to forgive you. He wants to embrace you regardless of where you are or where you have been. Are you disgusted in the cross or disbelieving? The Bible says at one point it pleased God to crush him. Not because God is sadistic, but God wanted to stop the path of evil. He wanted someone to take upon himself the darkness. Are you disbelieving? Well, God calls upon you to look upon Jesus and to believe. Believe today, the Bible says, and you will be saved. Are you disillusioned about Jesus and about his life? Do you see in the death of Jesus a reflection of your own pain? Do you try to avoid Jesus? Hear the words of Jesus to you. I have come that you may have life and life in abundance. If it were not for the death of Christ, we would never have life. We would never know God. To those who are Christians here who are believers, I ask you to reevaluate your relationship to the cross. We can become blasé about the cross. I want to ask you, does the cross still have meaning for you? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and follow him. Let us pray. Gracious God, God of the cross, we ask you that we might see and understand and that this cross, the Jesus of the cross, will change our lives. Give us a vision of where to go from now. In Jesus' name, Amen.
for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord.